On this episode of the ABB Podcast, we have come back here to our annual haunt at the Scarehouse, uh, <laughs> but have been able to sit down for the second time on this podcast uh, with my very good friend, Mr. Gavin Michael Booth. How's it going, buddy? First time on video. First time on video, yeah. yeah. You were the second fucking episode of this podcast. You were, uh, you were lo-fi. Lo lo <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, just, yeah. Just, the, uh, just the audio. The crappier back. environments, better gear. Yeah, yeah, pretty much, yeah. That's <laughs> Uh, but yeah, no, I want to, right at the top, I want to give a shout out to Scarehouse Windsor. Uh, they'll be running in September and October coming up. Uh, make sure you check them out. They've always been a big supporter of us uh, going years back right to the beginning. So check them out. And now, you know, go and, Well, they have two haunts this year too. So oh, check yeah. them out double because yeah, yeah. you think you've seen it all. I you have not. They uh, just got an early preview. And it's actually pretty terrifying. Very cool. So man, it's... <laughs> Like, I don't want to go back into, like, go redo the whole sort of where you grew up. Well, I was born at Hotel right. Grace. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> I mean, we kind of already did all of that yeah. when you were on the first time. Mostly, honestly, coming into this interview, I've, I've sort of been like, all right, what are we going to talk about? You've got a movie coming out. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of people know that it's going to get a lot of push on that, thankfully. Yeah. Uh, and that's great. I want to get around to that. But I sort of, just even in our brief conversations over the last week, we brought up a lot of sort of the the, the history, let's let's say, without going into the, the any of the specifics. The Windsor art scene, film well, scene, yeah. uh, the Windsor <laughs> film scene, the Windsor art scene, yeah. our history, mm -hmm. all of that stuff. And I kind of I got it's thinking getting old. It's right, yeah, to talk about it now. But I kind of go back to the last project you and I worked on. Mm -hmm. Going back was your I can't remember the name of the film. It was still here. Still here. Yeah, I almost said stand still. So <laughs> you were. But still here. And, like, I remember even going back into those days. Mm -hmm. You and I butted heads, you know, the passionate thing, whatever. But even before all of that, you always had this sort of, this this drive of, like, no matter what it takes. And it's so interesting to me now coming so much, like, ten mm -hmm. years further of all of that. I wonder what your perspective on all of that stuff then is now. It's interesting because, like, I, I sort of lost that drive for a while. It was there. I didn't lose it. I just like this industry is very unforgiving, and and even when you are rewarded, something else comes and constantly pulls the rug out from under you, right? Like that's just what it means to be an independent artist. Like victory, failure, 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 victory. And you just, you just have to like keep hoping the victories eventually slowly build you up. So you know, coming out, you know, when I was. 20 to 27 28 even you know you're like it's, it's all this and bigger it's like you know you're not you're not worried about paying rent you're not worried about a future you're not you're not sort of like tied down in relationships most of the time you said everything's possible so you're wide-eyed and like and you realize like you have to sort of keep that forever in order to do this there's no way to like let go of that because then you become too bitter and jaded and don't want to do it and it gets in the way but it is interesting looking back because i realize you know, I, I think I've always just sort of had like, because I didn't go to school for it, other than like general amorous marketing class and like, right. you know, <laughs> but it's just, I've, I've always sort of been able to identify like um, button pusher would be the polite word, shit disturber would be the more, the more accurate term. Like I just, I, I learned to not really care what people think and, and be willing to like do the marketing where you're like poking the bear and go like, oh, what's going to get everybody up in arms? And at the end of the day, it's like, it's just, you're just doing like a polite thing. Like back then I was, I had, I think while we were shooting that movie, I had my how many days, my daily yep. video project yeah. going. And I basically like, if you want to be in the crew of this movie, you better put one of these stickers. And like, do you remember we I had the vinyl stickers made that like a movie's being made in Windsor. If you want to find out what it is, go to stillheremovie.com yeah. or whatever. Yep. And, a, and a lot of our cast and crew like, put it on the back of their vehicles. And that becomes one of those things where like you would see it years later because people people get lazy and don't take bumper stickers off right. and stuff. And I just thought, you know, it was, it was just a game of what, how could I get any eyes? Because you know, I'm, I'm an independent filmmaker in Windsor at the time. There was nothing. It's not like I had a Hollywood agent and a manager and a studio doing marketing. It was just a game of trying to think in things that were affordable or free, how do you get the word out there, you know? But I was surrounded by musicians that were trying to hustle it it's stickers t-shirts and, and buttons and like uh watching the band the afters that i that i worked with a lot you know when that was sort of in the myspace explosion when i started working like i i watched them sit there and i was thinking about it the other day 
they would sit and individually they'd learn, okay, we're going to Phoenix, let's call up all the people on MySpace that we have in Phoenix and send a per like copy paste this personal message to each person, like, our concert's coming up this weekend, hope to see you there. I just finished my sorry Windsor, I just finished doing this to everybody that I know on Facebook. Movie premiere, movie premiere, please come out and support. Here's the link to tickets, here's why it's important for you to support independent art. And just you just kinda have to, to do it. Do you get brush back from that? Like, I mean, you know, you get brushed back from like the stunts. No, yeah, but, like no, no. even just the basics. Yeah, no, I know. I definitely know. There's even if like, even if they don't say it, I I can feel the eye roll when I send it to certain people. Like, uh, and I've been waiting for like there's probably like an ex girlfriend or a brother of an ex girlfriend or something that I'm just because I'm just I'm not thinking it's just right. another person, another person, another person just co copy paste, copy paste. So I'm like I'm waiting for the like. Go fuck yourself. You know, <laughs> well, I'm, really, I'm, I'm really waiting for it, but it hasn't, it hasn't happened yet. Uh, so, I'll get on that when I get back home. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Um, no, it's it's just, um, I don't know, that's sort of been the mentality I've always had. It's just whatever it takes to get out there. And that's the same as like, you're an actor. Film. You know, every day I try to like send one Facebook message or like, there's groups now on Facebook, like uh, it's called I Need a Producer. And there's a group in Toronto and a group in LA. And it's become like the place where you're like, I need a makeup artist for tomorrow. I need an editor. I'm looking for a music video director. And of course, they get like 100 to 300 replies instantly, but I just, I scour that all the time. It's it's, it's gambling. It's just a crapshoot. If you don't put your name there, You're they're never going to know you exist. And you know, you never... How much of it feels like lottery then though? Well, but then if you're smart, you go and send them a direct message as well and say, right. here's here's my website, cater something to what they're looking for. Not and just doing the lazy. Then if you can find their co company website, an email or whatever, yeah, just just be the one that goes a little more aggressive. I actually don't want to teach anybody this. Let's stop talking about right, it. Right, yeah, but, really you know, but it's actually, it's <laughs> funny that you say that because it's, the one thing that's, been, I have other questions that I want to sure. get back to, but the, one, but the one thing that's always been consistent with you, because I'm one of them, mm -hmm. your entire career, and I mean career back to fucking high school, <laughs> has always been built around, all right, I'm doing this fucking thing, who wants to come? Yep. Every step of the way, it's like Jerry Maguire, right? In the office, you know. Who's coming with me? Along the along the way, mm -hmm. because I was one of these guys too. Yeah, yeah. There's feelings get hurt, people get pissed off, mm -hmm. people misunderstand, people take advantage, mm -hmm. people right. Talk to me about like not the specifics of, of you know whatever, but talk mm -hmm. to me about the mental process of because you keep going. I like you and I have had personal conversations mm -hmm. back in the day of like. I spent all of this time teaching this motherfucker how to did it and that, <laughs> right? And even and even I know even people that we had conversations yeah. about that, even after those conversations, years later was like, all right, come on, let's go. Yeah. It's it's interesting. They there, you know, there's a few things like common sayings, don't burn bridges, like, you know, never 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 burn a bridge, you you're thinking you're gonna ever have to cross again, like don't bite the hand that feeds, like I, everything, everything that goes around comes around. Like, you know, when you're young, you're just like, I can't believe this is happening. But it's like, it's true. And it all boils down to, it's just business. And my way of doing business isn't their way of doing business. My entire philosophy has been, we should all work and create together. And if I can teach you and bring you along, let's keep doing that. But of course, that's my vision. And somebody who has their own vision can only sort of like serve or volunteer and work on my vision for so long. Right. And nobody's ever gonna have as much passion for my vision as me. How long did it take yeah. you to figure that a out? A long time. Yeah. It's still, there's there are still situations that like burn me. And like I'll speak about it and it's me just being a baby. It's the, um, a band that I'll make to like, I'll call them hit videos, you know? And then I see a third video Come, like I'm on YouTube, literally it's like, suggested view, this band's new video. I'm just like, huh. Yeah. I, because I find it interesting, I'm like, we made two hit things together. I just feel like what I would do if somebody had like, if, let's say somebody had acted in two of my movies and was phenomenal. And then I was making my next movie, and obviously if there's a role that suits them, they're the first person I'm calling. We already like working together, we already know we can build something, and then I can direct them, they can act, I would call them. But then I see this band, I was like, but to not even have the opportunity. I don't mind the competition of like, hey, we have a new song, send us, send us an idea. And if I send an idea and they go, not for us, we, we have to go with somebody else. Great. You know, it's yeah. art. Like every, yeah. everything's subjective and whatever they're looking for. But it's just, it's strange sometimes when you just, sometimes it feels like the business pull of like their management or their label or new people coming into their life. There's like, 
we've got a better, shinier thing over here. It's like, it just takes a long time to be like, that's just the way it is. There's nothing you can control. And you, you just, and it's so, it. it's so funny though, because that's really like, it's, you, you mm -hmm. say it like that, but that really is 90% of what it is. Like everybody doing this stuff, and it, like you get to a certain level, everybody's competent. Yeah. Everybody can basically get done what you want to yeah. do. And unless somebody comes with a very specific idea that you're like, that's the one I want, then it's like, you pretty much get away with anything. I mean, there's there's great example. But then what also did it too is the more like documentaries I watch about bands that I love, the history I look back. You know, I, I used to be a big fan of reading the back of why I miss CDs the most is like who makes this album? Who? Because sometimes it'd be like I I go to the record store before there were blogs about what CDs to buy, and you'd be looking at the back and be like, huh? Oh, I know this producer's name. He did that. Up. So sometimes it'd be like. Well, I'll take a risk on this band, or I think I've heard something on the radio, and they like, oh, the people involved are, are really good, I like them. But you would see, like, Nirvana Nevermind comes out, and that's Butch Vig that makes it, and arguably is, like, you know, the fourth member of the band that made the sound, of, and then they go do In Utero with somebody else. Great record, not as, not as popular or successful, and you're just like, why would you not keep... And I guess sometimes it's like you don't you don't want to be stale. If things start to feel yeah. stale, but usually that's a mutual thing where you're like, okay, everybody we, we, gets we, it. We, yeah, we, we get it, you know, because um, it's you know it's it's never it's never a budget thing. Like that's to my detriment. Budget has never been a concern. Like I, if I like a project for no money or lots of money, I say yes because I'm more unfortunately more driven by creativity than money. I say unfortunately because you know. As you get up in your years, you're like, oh, there's like real things I should be considering and saving for. Yeah, creativity doesn't more. necessarily pay the mortgage. Yeah, yeah. and I just, you know, that's, but my nature is just like, let's go shoot something on the weekend for free, don't care. So it's never been like, I was like, oh, I'm asking for too much money to come back and work with this right. band, you know. Um, yeah, but it's just, it's it just boils down to part of it. So I can, it's, it's like anything, I can piss and moan about it or I can just adapt and go with it. And, and Do you, does it, like, was it an effort for you to sort of learn that, or did you just kind of find yourself not getting as pissed off? Um, no, it's part of it, because part of it is I, I, like I won't watch those music videos that I need to do, because I, why, you know, it's kind of, it's like looking at a, I mean, when social media all came in too, right? It's like, it's like, uh, do I want to look at my ex? girlfriend and her buffer boyfriend who's got a better job and a nicer car. Right. I don't want to know if, if I don't want to know if the band's new boyfriend or girlfriend is better. Better. Right. You know, like it's just art is all subjective, but it's just like, yeah, you just you kinda I just don't I care. But I I, I know enough that I'll care more if I do watch it and let right. my feelings get hurt. So yeah, I just, yeah. it's like anything. Save yourself from the things that are gonna gonna hurt your feelings. That's you know, it. like it's like everything with comedy now that's like I'm offended. It's like, but I'm Dave Chappelle. I said, bring his new one where it says, like, you clicked my face on Netflix. Yeah. This is your fault right. that you're being offended right now. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it takes a long time because, you know, like a little or a lot, there's different theories on how much ego plays into like getting anywhere in life or believing that you have any, like before, before other people have been able to tell you, say, hey, you know what? Your art's pretty decent or like, you might be able to make it as a filmmaker. Like, you have to believe it. Yeah, you got to lie to and yourself. Self, self, yeah, <laughs> self-belief is one thing, but then, like, you don't have that ego to be like, oh, I can do this, I can do this, you know? So it's all, it's always an ego check when, when you don't get the gig or, you know, things you think are going to work out or a label doesn't call you for the next thing. But how much of that part of it? How much that balance has been, like, how much work have you put into that? Because arguably, and I, I, you've never hit yeah. this, but argue, you have... You have always been like the biggest ego that I knew. Not okay. even, not, and I don't even mean that as as a slight. No, I know, you yeah, know what yeah. I mean. Because um, ego always gets mistaken as only negative. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I mean it. I mean it is just like no, I'm going to do this no matter what fucking happens. And I wonder if you, because like that ego will also get you into trouble, kind mm -hmm, of thing. Of course. And I, and I wonder, like, is it is it just aging? Was it actual like mental work? Was it was it like because you don't have that sort of you still have the same drive, but you don't yeah. have the sort of like drive at any cost kind of. Well, it's interesting because it's you know living. I always say it like this when I when I did move from Windsor to Toronto in two thousand early two thousand thirteen, I would say it was like 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 a rubber band. You can stretch it so far, but once that moving truck got far enough up the four hundred one, snap. 
and it was just like I was like disconnected. I like broke free of Windsor. What I mean by that is like what I've experienced here, and I've seen it amongst other artists and bands, is you know there were three or four people trying to make films. There were four or five bands at any given time that were like having rising success or getting on the radio, and there would be I remember like Ashes of Soma. Love them, worked with them, got on the radio. You know, Sean that owns the haunted house owned owned the club where they were all coming up. They would get on the radio, and suddenly a lot of the other bands around them were like, "Fuck those guys, sellouts!" And it's it's jealousy and and butthurt feelings that why not me? Because if there was a mentality right until there's a show, and then it's like, "Hey, can we open?" Yep. Yeah, no, no, nobody's <laughs> ever said it. Maybe it's my theory alone, but it, yeah, that's but that's what they should have done. How did you guys get on the radio? Could you explain that process? Can I take you to lunch? Like, is there any chance we could open a show for you? Like, would you ever consider coming and playing with us at this thing? Like, take get their advice. You know, like see, and, and not in like a you don't have to do it in like a schmarmy way of like you know like take take me with you, but like work work with them instead of against them. But you know, my what I what I noticed, and even if it's just my own observation, is there was a lot of like success for somebody here meant failure and opportunity lost for everybody else. But once you like open up and realize oh there are four bands in every town or city everywhere in the world all trying to do the same thing and ultimately your competition is everyone else around you so you know you move to toronto it's like you can't keep tabs on all the other directors and producers so there's you know social media again caused a problem where like you could see what your competition was doing so you had to learn very early on to not care about that but i moved to toronto and then there's like uh, my friend Warren Sonoda, still a very good friend, he would he would have these dinners where he'd invite ten directors and be like, We should all meet each other. Who what are you trying to do? Oh, you have that connection over there. Like helping everybody make their hours just like this is this feels the opposite the opposite right. of Windsor, you know? Well um, um Christian Aldo Aldo, yeah. Um said it when when I was talking to him, he said going moving to Toronto was like somebody like took the weight off. Like like somebody lifted the lid off of his, yeah. his ability to create. He, I mean, I know Christian Baird, we're doing our after party for Toronto oh, at his space uh, at Super great. Wonder Gallery. He, uh, he's always been one of my favorite creators. Yeah. The first film- Actually, I met him through you. The yeah, first yeah. film I had ever heard about being made in Windsor was Zeno's Inferno. Right. And I saw Which that- he's still I, playing. Yeah, I know, yeah. I know, I know. And he's still tweaking and trying to edit it. <laughs> God bless him. But he, I saw that trailer on like a quick time video on his, we're talking like 2000 one or two right. like and I was just like who is this he made a move this, in winter this is what I want to do I got to talk to this guy you know I thought I can't approach him he's a film director like he's serious he's made a movie I'm a nobody you know but he, he's one of my first art friends you know especially growing up in Amherstburg you're not necessarily in the Windsor scene and I didn't go to university or college so I, I, I didn't get involved in art scenes like through school or just you know hey we're gonna go to this club like I, I wasn't in the know of what was happening I was sitting in my parents' house in Amherstburg, just like, oh, I gotta write screenplays, and that's the way to do it. But yeah, it, it's, um, for Christian, somebody like Christian, you know, he's also a very outside-of-the-box artist. Yeah. Windsor is a blue-collar town. It's yeah. not it's not designed for him, so like, it, and he, very much like him, I probably waited way too long to leave the city, right. you know? I, I kept trying to fight against the city to make this scene happen here, and realistically, that doesn't have to be my battle. I wanted the scene to work here so that I could live here and selfishly keep creating here. If it helped other people too, awesome. That's not what it was about for me. Right. I, just, I wanted to live here. I love this area. Right. Um, but by moving, yeah, you're suddenly like, oh, there's all these other like-minded people that have come from their small town and their sort of like feeling of being oppressed artistically and now we're all sort of free to create. How much of a cliche does that become though? It, I guess it depends with the people you hang around with, you know? Like, I, I, the one thing I've learned too is just to eliminate the talkers from the doers, you know? And you, the more you're in art, you start to identify people like, you're talking, and if we talk six months from now or two years from now and you still haven't started that screenplay you told me about, I'll still be your friend, I'll have coffee with you. It's not, it's not like, oh, get that person away from me, but it's like, just mentally, we're probably not going to collaborate. Never, never burn a bridge. Right. But you're just like, I need to spend my time and energy and the free time I have for coffee with the doers. Because they're the people where then I'm creatively inspired. Like, you're doing this. How can I help that? Do you want to get involved in what I'm doing? And the more doers you surround yourself with, the faster you will see things change. But that's part of it. Like you said, the idea of like, this is the next thing I'm doing. Who's coming with me? It's the doers that 
there's a few talkers that think they're doers. Right. And they're the ones that show up for a day or two of production and then just, oh, I hurt my back, my my dad's sick, I can't get the days off, whatever excuse it is to yeah. to leave. But you know, you're and at the time you're like, I can't believe this person didn't follow through. But you're, it's almost better than not there. Right. In sight. Yeah, because then you're not. Re- at least you're not relying on them. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um. One of one of the questions that I did have, I want you to talk to me about. I want you to talk to me about pushing through, like the hardest times. Because hmm. and I don't know if this is. I don't think I knowing you well enough. I don't think this is too personal. But if it is, let me know. Yes. I remember. <laughs> I remember having. I remember a phone call that I got from you, back in I don't know, like back when we were working. Yeah. yeah. Where because you 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 made your your living off of this DVX, the Sony DVX. Okay? Mm-hmm. And you had lent it to somebody or something and it came back and it was done. Like you just could not get the fucking camera mm-hmm. going again. And I remember a phone call where it was the only time I ever heard an ounce of quit at you. <laughs> and I remember you saying, I'm fucking done. I just had enough. And I also remember everybody around you, like all of the core team, actually I just ran into Giselle yesterday. Oh, nice. Yeah. Awesome. So, um, but I remember everybody around, like everybody was just like, what do we got to do? What do we got to do? So, so talk to me about through, through some of those. Mo- I don't even I know if you remember that particular. I don't. I remember the DVX 100 very well. Right. Panasonic, Panasonic had sponsored me with them and shot everything with it. But yeah, when you're, when you're a broke artist, and your tool breaks, your one, the camera that I can't replace because I'm, because I wasn't a great businessman. I'm still not a great businessman, but like it was, you know, you didn't, if when you have equipment, you put a certain amount of money away from every job because one day you're going to have to replace the equipment. And like, that's not the thought on my brain. It's just like, just keep going. So when it breaks, I, I don't remember that breaking. I'll say it's probably karma for me breaking the button off of Mike Poirier's camera years ago that has caused a, a, a riff in, you know, you know, we don't. We don't have to go that ended far up, back. Yeah, but it's probably you, karma. Yeah. You ended up. You ended up getting it to work eventually. Okay. You didn't have to replace it. You ended up getting it to work eventually. Yeah, professionally just, cleaned or something. I, I don't know what it was, but yeah. So but I was, what but that said. to me, the, you know, there's there's been a couple couple low points for sure where I've said, okay, I quit. There's one um, dear dear friend Courtney Reed. I once she kind of like I remember very clearly we went for ice cream and sat in the park. And uh, I've had this also with Steph Gabriel, where they both just at different times just kind of looked at me and said, I said, I, I'm going to do something else. Maybe I'll teach. I don't know. Maybe I'll just go do commercial work somewhere else and get hired somewhere. I don't want to put up with this anymore. Because most of being an artist is heartbreak and disappointment. Which I'll, I'll tell you how I've turned it into a theory that helps me, helps me survive my, my mantra. But it, they both had a version of, what else are you going to do? You know, looked at me. Like, well, I could. They're like, you're not gonna do that. You're gonna hate that. You know, and that was that was the realization. Like, doesn't matter how difficult it's gonna be. I'm not wired to do anything else, and I have to do it. That's an that's an interesting. It's funny. It's an interesting line that I always. And again, coming back to cliche, I always kind of thought a bit. Mm-hmm. Thought as a bit of a, a cliche in that, like. Oh, you know, like this is what I was born to do, or like I don't know how to like. I, yeah. There was nothing else I was ever gonna do. I came from a place where it's like there's nothing I can't do. Yeah, you know what I mean. Fair. So it, I, I've always kind of wondered, like, is that just a bullshit line that people like? No, tell I have this like really is that focus thing? where I wake up thinking about movies, like to the point that my brother, five or six, he was visiting for Christmas. We only see each other every three or four years. He just kind of said, like, can you talk about anything else but movies? And I, like I'd never thought about it before, like that's all I talk about. And Sarah, my wife, who's an actress, we talked about it recently. Like we should probably take a cooking class or something. We should do because we do our entire lives are wrapped up in if we're going out is to see someone's independent film, we're going to this networking event, we're with our actor friends, and it's just like oh the audition season this year, pilot season, what's happening? Oh, have you seen these new shows? What's happening with Netflix and Disney Plus? The industry is changing, and like this is the film I'm trying to make. And it's just all consuming all the time. It's like. You know, almost if you don't have something else to like, you know, that's why some people paint or some people jog or some people do whatever. But I've just been like tunnel vision on, on movies my whole life. My, my parents have always known it. My teachers knew it. Mm-hmm. Um, but the whole idea of like the, the disappointment thing and learning 
Yeah, yeah and I do remember, you were probably talking around the time that the, the film collapsed. Yeah, probably right yeah. around that had, time. Had yeah. a talk openly about it now I had this top secret project called Four Shots yep. I was going to have a fake movie name over it the movie was uh, I mean I know you know it well but I'll say it for, for viewers and listeners it was a movie like Blair Witch Project but meets a shooting in a high school kind of thing it's all going to feel very real it's going to be shot in secret so we can market it like a real event and the marketing campaign was part of the part of the hook and like a major studio distributor in LA and a, and a producer who like had MTV Movie Awards and Oscar nominated for his writing Smokey and the Bandit. And, you know, he was on board to make it. This was like the big, this is it. But part of it was I had sort of like been telling the, commer- the few commercial clients I had, and stuff, I'm, I'm putting all of that away, so you're gonna have to find someone else to do your commercials. The stuff that was like my bread and butter and paying for my existence in Windsor. I got this movie deal, hadn't signed the deal yet. <laughs> and, then, and then, you know, not soon after uh, the Virginia Tech massacre. And I've come to learn since. So, you know, full update, I have not made that movie yet. Right. And, and it's come up a couple different times. Mel Gibson's icon bought it. And I went through the same thing again. We're going, we're going, we're going. And the real life shooting. And we're going, we're going, we're going. And the real life shooting. And eventually it was me that said, I'm out. I don't want to make this movie anymore. I want to make the movie. I can't deal. But I had put all my eggs in that one basket. And this is it. I'm grabbing these coattails to Hollywood and, and I'm gone. So when it all came crashing down, so I was like, oh, I've given away some of my commercial clients and I don't, like, I literally don't have anything anymore. It's, yeah. it's so funny because the, an, a, with a, I don't want to start getting into politics, but an argument that I thought was gone forever crept up after this last fucking shooting, which was it's video games fault. Okay. Which is just like yeah. it's it's rock and roll's fault. That's well, okay. Me. So Walmart saved it because they or solved it because they took all the violent video game commercials, commercials off, right? right? And they've yeah. also um, they're still selling guns and ammunition, just, just less, the, just less of it. Cool. Yeah. Um, so anyway, yeah. like I said, not getting into politics, but like it's funny that you brought up the school shooting stuff because like everybody talks about like oh entertainment is the co- and it, and all I and I mean bias because yeah, it's yeah. the industry we're in. All I remember hearing is every time one of those things came up, another project got canned. Got canned. I remember, yeah. you know, after 9-11, fucking Schwarzenegger's film got, got it, shelved it just, for like three years or something. The Blumhouse and Universal's The Hunt just oh. was pulled from distribution because Fox News took a, uh, sorry, Right Wing Media took a dislike into a movie that was essentially, I believe it's about liberals that are killing, uh, you know, uh, Republican you, oh, voters, you know, over, like yeah. Trump supporters, essentially. And they made an outcry in the media, and it was loud enough that it, it made them, like, you know, buckle. They're all publicly traded companies, so they have to do what's in right. the best interest of the company. Pull it. Which I believe is just a great marketing ploy where now never, every news outlet on the planet is talking about a movie that they weren't talking about last week, and then they'll put it on Netflix or something else. Remember the interview? Yep. With James yep. Franco and all the, all the stuff that that did? That got them... All of the free advertising that the movie wasn't building traction on its own. Oh, it's <laughs> I, I'm I, it, well, you and I have always paid attention to this stuff and sort of even privately commented on you know the the way stuff tracks yeah. and media and stuff. But like my biggest one it's recently, magic, right? Look at the distraction while we figure something else out to make this well, project stronger. The one that's come up in front of me most recently mm-hmm. is all of these articles about how you know there's this new ridiculous outrage about this thing attached to this new album that's coming out that I never heard about until I heard oh, about yeah, this yeah, new yeah, outrage yeah, yeah, that yeah, I've yeah, never heard about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, now they don't even wait for the mm-hmm. fake outrage. They yeah. just fake that there's fake outrage. Fake the fake outrage. Yeah. yeah. It's all, I mean, God, one of the best movies ever, David Mamet's script for Wag the Dog. Great if, movie. If we don't live in Wag the Dog times with, like, and we're getting closer, because that's about them faking the scenes from the war, faking a war to help a president out of a scandal. But they do it by bringing in a Hollywood producer and like, oh, all you got to show is the shot of the bomb, the night vision thing, and, and a refugee running with a, you know, it's like Kirsten Dunst running with the bag of potatoes and they CGI in a baby or whatever against the blue screen. But with all these like deep fakes and things that are coming out, like it's good. We, if we're not already in it, we are so close to the thing where we will never, ever know the truth again. Here's the, the thing. full truth. I don't, I don't buy that. Yeah. I don't buy that for a second because the people who want to know the truth are, are working just as hard to find all of that stuff. Here's, but no, 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 wait, 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 wait. Sorry, we'll never be with the, with the public comes yeah, to agreement. Yeah, 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 fair yeah. enough. <laughs> but here's my favorite part of that. 
Now, and again, not, I don't want to go mm-hmm. down political lines, but it's just, this was too fucking funny. So everybody, since Trump got into office, everybody's talking, oh, we're living in idiocracy. Yeah, yeah. And then two fucking days ago, he comes out and pulls up a map of the hurricane go, where they've sharpened, forget deep fake, they used a fucking Sharpie marker to like, it's like, we're not even, exactly like, yeah. we yeah. don't need deep fake. We're at a point yeah. where like the president is just like, nope, look, it went there. Yeah. I, living in America and not being able to vote as a green card holder, I just, it's not that I don't care, I just can't. You can't care. I can't. Like when friends bring it up at dinner parties, like, can we talk about, like my brother, from my movie obsession, can we talk about anything else? Right. Because there's a political obsession, and rightly so, but it's like, I also know a lot of these people that I'm talking to at dinner parties didn't vote, aren't out actively campaigning for what they believe in, like, oh, I made my Facebook post, I've solved the world, it doesn't matter. Got to get your hands dirty. You got to get in for any cause you believe in and put the time in, volunteer, go speak to people, hand out pamphlets, whatever it takes. If you're not doing that, if you're on social media bitching about things, you are not part of the solution. That's, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's funny because coming from like, mm-hmm. you and I coming through the whole thing, right? I often was, and still sometimes get to the fingers going. You know how many times we now? Have a, we have a local friend who has solved everything with comment. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's amazing to me how often in this business mm-hmm. people like, like even though you're in the business and you see all of the, like it, to me it's all a fucking magic show, right? Like mm-hmm. no matter what piece of this, it's a, it's all, like you said, it's a little bit like, hey, yeah, yeah. Is, we're, you know, got to get this done over here. It's, it's amazing to me how many people even in the business don't understand that. Don't even like. Don't even like. Well, because it's so because everything's so like juicy and like it, it, now it's like targeting emotions, right? So if you can get to people's emotions before their logic, you've, you've hooked them. They're just I'm so angry about. I the best example I've just and, and this is pure just like BS that does not matter. But it's Robert Patterson got Robert Patterson got cast as Batman. Okay. Internet lots of shit. He's the Twilight kid. They do that every time they hire. I understand. No, I get it. Right. Then this one headline, I forget the word, he was like, Robert, Robert Pattinson drops role for Batman or something. And everyone was like, he's not Batman anymore? What? But what they were saying was Robert Pattinson has had to back out of another movie right. due to the schedule for Batman. But they worded it. It's that clickbait headline that I hate because no one reads the article. Mm-hmm. They see it on Facebook and they share it they go, what? Why did they make all this fuss about him being Batman? He's not going to be Batman. It's like, that's not what the headline says. It sounds like it says that, but, you know. Well, it's just like any any time a headline asks a question, the answer is no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> is this too far? No. No. no it's yeah. not. Because yeah. you wouldn't have to ask the question. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. We uh, already collectively agreed. Yeah. So, the, the one thing, in addition to the, you know, shit disturber, all of that yeah, stuff, yeah. the one thing that, that has always really, really impressed me Um with how you work is every step of the way, and I think this goes back to the whole art thing, every step of the way you have always tried to play with like the latest and newest mm. and what is like what's on the cusp mm-hmm. and even like even things that didn't necessarily go, but you were always playing with the newest stuff. Mm-hmm. I think that's why you and I always got along yeah, when we were yeah. working. But talk to me talk to me about that process and, and, and sort of like maybe if you understand what drives it a little bit and then even like the challenges of of trying to pitch those kinds of ideas. Sure. Okay. So it's like it's like being a tinker. Like people like you know people are like have a you know back in the day used to be like I'm going to build my own ham radio and I'm going to play with things. Like I think that would have been me if I grew up in that era. Or you know my dad built model trains, built these elaborate train sets that took up our entire garage or basement sometimes. And, um, you know, so so it's it's part of it's part of art to want to understand the new tools because every, every new iPhone that comes out or whatever is like that's my new paintbrush. That's a new color of paint that I haven't had to play with before. But um, you know, I, I have a lot of friends that are love them to death. They're super awesome technical filmmakers. They're not creative filmmakers, but they know all the latest. They know whatever I know about a camera that I think is a lot, they know 20 times more. They're probably technically more proficient than me to use the camera, but they're not looking at what to do creatively with that. So for me, it's like, even even before I was playing with the technology, it's like when uh, DTS sound came out, um, like 
digital CD quality sound or THX or um, laser disc. Lasers had a laser disc player. Watched I know. It all the time. Yep. Yeah. Um, like the way that, that things work. So I know you're thinking probably specifically of like the Blue Stones video. Uh, no, as a matter of fact, I was thinking about the Blue Stones video, mm -hmm. laser disc, yeah. Periscope movie. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Fuck, what else was there? Well, even just how many days yeah. was the first fucking vlog? I know. Like, I came in too early and gave up too early. <laughs> like, and, and that only sort of recently Before occurred you could, to like, me. Monetize. Yeah. So, how many days was the project? Again, for the audience, you know it very well. You took all the photos for the website. I looked at YouTube when it came out and I said, this is so. You know, what had happened was uh, there was my, my friend Andy that had Mila, the sick daughter. Uh, and, and you know, almost accidentally, like just out of like wanting to help, post a little video, ask anybody that would donate. But YouTube was brand new, and at that time it was yeah. a bit of a joke. It's like who's the, who the fuck is gonna go watch somebody's like backyard barbecue yeah, yeah. videos and shit? But it, yeah. like some school would do like a, a nickel fundraiser that was help, like helping somebody with a legitimately like ill child, and it was just like, oh wow, there is this social aspect to it. And then obviously like uh, Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon was a book right. and like this idea that you're only really that you're not that far away from anybody you want to get to in life. And that's how all business is done. I want to talk to the president of that company. Who do I know? Well, um, my son's baseball team is their dad works for the trucking company that does the, you know, just one by one you find your way there. Um, so they, how many days was, I said, I'm going to take the 12, like celebrities, the artists that have inspired me, like Spielberg was the big get, Kevin Smith, uh, Tarantino, Rodriguez, the people who, who made the films that I identify with and the style of filmmaking that I sort of adapted and, and chased. And I said, what if I do a video blog every single day and we'll see how many days it takes. The, the idea was I will make the video, but I can't send, try to send the video to them. I just have to put it out into the universe, which is like the secret. Which you know, Kevin right? Smith famously said, asshole, why didn't you just fucking write me? <laughs> Amazing. Um, so yeah, but it was it was uh, just a social experiment. So anybody who would find the video would ask at the end, if you know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody, and you like this video, please forward it on. And it like, uh, my friend Jonathan in LA that I still see from time to time, he, came, he came, actually came to my last call premiere and really surprised me. He called me one day and showed me a picture of him, like, with how many days card, like, this close to Spielberg, and he just was the next in line before he left. So there were people actively trying to, like, tell people, like, hey, there's this guy that just wants to interview you and, and sit down with you. And it was, that, that sort of, like, showed me what it could do. Of course, vlogging has become the thing, and uh, YouTube made it to you monetize videos. All of that didn't exist when I was doing it. But part of my rule was, like, if I missed a day and didn't post a video, I had to quit. I got to like, it was like day 1,999 or day 2,000 that, that, that happened. But it, it happened because I was so busy making music videos and making my art that it was like, oh, I've sort of arrived. I don't need this thing anymore. And I missed a day and I said, I'll, I buy my own rules. I gotta, I gotta pack it up. Um, so there is this weird five year perfect Capsulation. My, my friend Leslie joked that it uh, should have been called uh, probably how many lays for, <laughs> for the different girlfriends that I would have over the course of the course of the video. Um, shout out to Leslie for that one. That's a good one. Uh, uh, and if she watches, I'll know because I'll get a phone call with a hilariously loud cackle for, for remembering that. Um, but yeah, it, but it, it, what was interesting was still from that project, I met people in different cities that are still very dear friends of mine and are still supporting the, the work that I do. And like, that was sort of the, these were the 12 people I wanted to meet. I only met a handful of them, which was awesome. The people I met around that are, that, that's the greatest gift. If, if you put yourself out there and people like what you do, you'll, you'll find more collaborators. What did you learn from that project? Um, persistence is key in anything. Well, um, cause the 1099, you're looking almost four years, right? Uh, My math is terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Four years. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Every day. No more. Like well, almost five years. Okay. Like I said, I'm not good at math. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, both terrible. We, have, we were trained at General Amherst High School. What do you it. want? Yeah. But 
So persistence was the big one. Persistence is big, but it's also it's the the rule of ten thousand hours, which you said anybody who use that like, oh, you want to be good at guitar, ten thousand hours. You want the the theory of put ten thousand hours into anything, and you will become an expert, or at, at least level, yeah. at least very. Is he the one who said yeah. it? Okay, yeah. at least very proficient. It's true. So every day I was using my camera, filming, trying to think creatively. I mean, I'm saying the same damn thing for for two thousand videos, like. Okay, let's do something fun. Let's do something different. So I'm shooting, I'm editing. Like, so my editing skills are getting better because I get bored editing it. Let's try this effect. Let's try this technique. Let's, I'm learning more about audio mixing. I'm learning all the tools that like essentially, I got however many hours of video, finished video I edited with that. Um, you know, it taught me so much about social media and how to use social media to market because I'd see this video worked and caught attention. There's people hate when I talk about this. People like this, you know, so it's sort of like a bit of market research of what is my voice in social media, which if you look at my Instagram, I've always been like a late adapter to all of these things where I'm like, I don't want another thing I have to do. When before I was like, MySpace, give it to me. This is gonna be the best thing right. ever. Um, but my Instagram is rarely photos of me, unless it's like a media image. It's like, it's always an outward look of what I figured, because I'm like, like People don't care what I had for breakfast. People don't care what I think about politics. People don't care about what I thought about the latest Transformers movie. None of that matters. Um, it's about the people who follow me are interested in filmmaking, maybe like the films that I make. And I just want to show a little bit of like, this is life on set. And it's not the ego thing of look at me pose with the, with the expensive camera. Like, but it's just, here's a snapshot of my journey day by day of slugging it out and, be, and being honest and open. How many days was always that? It was like, it was like a confessional some days. Like some of that journey through that, that film failure and everything is all captured, kept captured is very heavily available? in there. I've privatized most of them, but I feel like really? the interview with Kevin Smith still exists and I still get emails every three months from somebody that like saw that interview was like, I'm inspired. I went and checked out your you website. Like, I don't know. I just, because now all the monetization tools exist. Yeah, but I but I had like a couple flags against my channel for okay. using like music because at the time stuff, there wasn't. Time yeah, so to, like yeah. so my channel's like like uh, contaminated. So I right. really, I do I do think often about you know, and you're one of the inspirations for this is like I there's something I want to say in podcasting. I just I don't. I've got the idea. I've been actually recording episodes now and like acquiring the gear. And We've been talking about this. No, I know. Pretty much the time. Remember what you just said when somebody talks about a project? Because you and I have been talking about yeah. you starting this since the day I started this fucking thing. But I don't. I've also learned don't do anything half-assed. Fair enough. So until I have the proper time, I'm gonna keep yeah, going. Yeah, yeah, anyway, yeah, yeah. So. I know it's fine. But like, <laughs> you know, until I have the proper time and a system and a structure and a full understanding of how to like. Push it out into the world. I want to. I want to wait. I've got. I've got enough things going right. on. You know, to keep me busy. Um, but trying. Yeah, I've been building a little. Got soundproofed a little studio in my apartment and have. You know, got all the mics. Just teaching myself the engineering of audio and. Uh, I'll do it. I just. I just. You know. Got to get there. Yeah, and even just figure out the core, the core questions, and what it is because there's so many advice shows and just one-on-one -on -one interview shows. You know, I got to figure out what. To, what to say? Actually, every time you ask me something, I'm like, God, I'm so jealous. This is the best interview I've ever had because it's just you know, which I appreciate because I get to talk about things that never come up normally. But I'm like, man, I just don't have that. Like, this is the next question. This is the next question. Well, you know, I appreciate you saying that. And to, to, for me, not that this is a fucking about yeah. me, but like, that's basically been the core takeaway for me from this entire thing. Like, even going into this, I didn't think. You and I have always joked, I've always joked that yeah. I never shut the fuck up. <laughs> and I've somehow managed to like make a career out of sitting here and shutting the fuck up for yeah. the most part. Sure. Right? <laughs> yeah, I, I realize I, people would, would disagree. I, I think the best wisdom any of us learn is listen yeah. and talk. You know? But it's just, that was the biggest takeaway is like all of this stuff, even just this part of me, like that part that was always like, oh, I want to know. Hey, tell me more. That's a, that can be a skill. That yeah. can be a thing you can turn into a positive instead mm -hmm. of, because you know damn well, you've been around me enough. Like, they, they, my mouth was not a positive, <laughs> like, in many, many ways. Hey, we're all, we're all young and brash. <laughs> right, right. In life. You know, and that's the thing. Like, I, it's interesting because um, it was actually Sarah Fitzgerald who put it, who put it best at one point in time who said, you're Windsor's boogeyman. You're the boogeyman of the art scene. Most people who don't know you only know 
the legend or the rumor or hear the asshole story of like, oh, he flipped out on this set. Somebody got mad said, don't ever work with him. We've, you've, you've gone to meetings where people have been like, I can't work with you, AJ, because you work with Gavin Poof. That is happening. All that small town yep. youth. It's all small town youth, ego. It's, it's all, hopefully it's, all, on, on my end, it's like I've been doing my best to clear the air with all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, greatest, greatest example is, um, can't say what yet, but the Windsor Film Festival, you know, famously in Windsor, I protested them, and that's, you know, oh, that guy. Da, da, da. Yeah. You know, do doing what I can right now to, to finally put put that to Smooth rest. Smooth that out, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, if, if nothing else, in honor of Mark Buscario, who who and I, he and I had settled that a long time ago, but yeah. it, it's left it's left her feeling. So like, um, but yeah, Sarah said, I bet you're like the Windsor Film or Film Arts boogeyman because you know people go, oh yeah, yeah, not that guy. Well, do you know him? Have you ever? No, no, no. Okay, was that? that bad right. you're like yeah but I think it's like anything it's like if you're on their side and working with them you're probably friendly if you're on the other side you're not an enemy but like you know you're, you're gonna see a different perspective and that's I've learned that because I I hear that all the time even about like bands that I work with like oh that singer's an asshole I'm like sometimes but there are times <laughs> sorry to be sorry because I know exactly <laughs> who you're talking about <laughs> but asshole to you Pays my bills, treats me well, helps me network, builds right. my career up. You know what I mean? Like so that just, tour didn't work out. You didn't have to write an article about it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, well, that's a, a cone of silence. Right, right. Um, yeah, no, it's 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 interesting. Uh, you, I think it, it's it, it's age, right? You look back and like, I I won't say that I regret anything, but I definitely poked some bears that I didn't need to. Right. There were better ways to go about it. It was still fun. Didn't know any at the time. Yeah. If like, I could have come up with them, I might have like taken the, them. The action girls and the missing the, the, oh, the music video yeah. where I put up all that. It was a the music video was about abduction, like in this in this horror movie esque way. But we marketed it with the fake missing posters, which was not it's not my idea. I'm a ripoff artist. I saw it with the Blair Witch Project. Right. We put up fake missing posters all over Sundance. So like I got in trouble for not even an original idea. So you know right. that that was the best. And, well, and that's and, funny because that's and by like, trouble, I mean it made the music video way more popular. Right, right. You know? Well, that's back. That's back when that kind of when that kind of attention yeah. could actually like push you. Well, maybe yeah, this now, is, now it's a fine line. Yeah, and yeah. there's that's my question. That you and I and I, we, we won't get into it because like private mm-hmm. is private, whatever. But like we we joked about sort of like eh, well, it's we're never gonna survive in this world now. Yeah, but yeah. like. You have to survive in this world. I mean, I, to me, to a lesser extent, but you yeah, have yeah. to. You have to survive in that world now. What is? I mean, Dave Chappelle said it best. I watched his new special. He, has, he just has a line, be like, "I don't think I've done anything wrong, but we'll see." You know, because he goes, "It's not if people decide that's the thing I've done wrong. That's that's the thing. You know, if it catches critical mass, um, I I just don't buy into any of that. Like, you're allowed to be offensive. People can be offended." I've learned a long time ago I don't need everybody to like me. I need very few people in life to actually like me. That's right. the that's the real truth. Um, if you try to please everybody, you're never going to do anything daring or brash. You know what I mean? Your, your art will suffer if it comes from this, like, we have to sanitize everything. Like, I, um, you know, Netflix, if you're out there, I want to work with you. But they recently pulled the uh, suicide scene from 13 Reasons Why. They're serious because okay. it's such a public outcry. Disclaimer, I've not seen the episode. Uh, from what I understand, it very romanticized. It was shocking to some because they actively show her slashing her wrist, but it made it look kind of romantic. And they were trying to cor- you know, correlate it to, oh, there are teens that are now like, oh, this is the way to do it. You right. know? Maybe that happened. Even if it happened, I don't think you should change the art. That's what the artist wanted to say. Because that would be like, well, Marilyn Manson, what if you took that one lyric out? Right. It's like, no. You know, I, I think it's in the movie The Doors, but not didn't actually happen in The Doors. We're like, you're not going to say this this word on the show or what I remember. And then he, yeah. he goes on saying, and I can't remember if that actually happened or not, but like, no, like you you have to say the thing that you want and be confident in it. You can't, but it's that it's that sometimes that corporate sanitizing, well, we got shareholders now and we have to appease everybody and Disney firing James Gunn and then rehiring him for Guardians of the Galaxy over a 10-year-old tweet, Kevin Hart losing the Oscar. You know, all of that is just like, you know, 
I don't know. That's just the politics of the business, right? But I do understand the larger part of it that the Me Too movement, everything, all of that's valid and needed to come out. Like the, the real stories and the horror stories, but it swings so far. Yeah. The Enzi Sanzaris, the things now that were, who's the guy that, that ran, he ran a very popular like, movie or entertainment site. He's now, it's now sort of been like retracted where, where it was found out that the, the, the woman who had accused him had essentially made it all up and oh really he just yeah he just finished settling a lawsuit he's got a new entertainment channel and like trying to like yeah see I, mean, I try not to follow it's like years of his life like, yeah. but it's just stuff through reading all this that I but yeah. you know it, it's I get it it's gotta most things go overboard especially with the social media push now because everybody everybody reads the headlines and doesn't doesn't do the research for themselves politics it's, it's everywhere now um, I don't of course I keep in mind and there's you know being married is, is a very good thing for me with Sarah because I say, I'm going to do this. She goes, I know 25-year-old you is all <laughs> piss and vinegar and like, I want to fight the system and fuck everybody and just do it my own way. She goes, but let's think about the long-term repercussions of this. And do you, does Gavin Booth have to do that? Or does Gavin Booth just really want to do that because he's a, he's a devious little, you know, <laughs> mischief creator? And I'm like, most of the time it's that and I don't and it seems like that sort of like viral shock marketing is fun to me yeah even even with it's a, uh, it's a toy to you right I've been making a, and it doesn't come out of any hurt feeling because like but we uh, have not been accepted into a single Canadian film festival with our Canadian film wow which is played in Italy and like and I, I just I didn't expect I thought Surely, a Canadian. Right. We're Canadian films so hard, and we all work together, and like, but just has. But that's because thousands and thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of films are submitted to festivals. Right. Of course, nine thousand nine hundred of those have to lose. Right. You know, I was just one of the losers. But I thought about making like a um, uh, a festival rejection tour shirt. So it's kind of like the old band shirts with all the yeah. cities and dates. Like have all the festivals like. That to me is just funny, and that's that's me trying to keep my ego in check and, and wear my failures literally on my sleeve. I think it's funny, and then but you know, Sarah always said, "Well, look at the perception of it. Like maybe maybe you'll just look bitter and jaded." I, I just think it's funny to right. wear your failure, but yeah, there is that perception of like, "Oh, okay, you're you're gonna come off like an asshole who's bitter he didn't get." Which is so or, funny yeah. because if you were really all that bitter, there's no way you could do it. Fair. That's that's true because you wouldn't. Yeah, you yeah. wouldn't be able to get past the bitter to, to yeah. wear it on your sleeve like that. No, I love. I think that I. That's the other thing I've learned. Like, fail, uh, celebrate the failures. Every time a music video, I was like, "This is gonna. This is my favorite idea." And then, funk. Right. Nobody else thought so. You know, just, right. just six six views and a like. You know. Yeah. Um, and then last call, where I was like, I think we made a pretty good movie, but now the reaction has been like overwhelming to a degree I could yeah, not let's, let's get like to it. let's get to it for yeah. sure I, we've been we've been avoiding not not avoiding but we haven't talked about the reason you're here what is but, what is so let's get on to it man the reason you're in town back in town because it was a year ago today we started right a year ago today uh, September 5th 2018 we started filming last call which basic premise man ready to end his life calls the suicide hotline uh, has misdialed because he's already drinking and taking pills in, in preparation to, to end his life. Uh, ends up connected to a random stranger, a woman, a character named Beth, who's a night janitor at a college, not expecting this call at all. She's only answering the phone because she's told her babysitter to call there with in case her son comes home because he hasn't come home and they've been fighting. Uh, and when she answers the phone and realizes what this man's up to, realizes she's down a very, you know, tough situation if she has to stay on, doesn't have to, but chooses to stay on the phone and try to change the outcome. And the way we choose, chose to shoot the movie was in a single take with no edits and split screen. So we have two camera crews running in different parts of Windsor, it was all shot here, um, in different parts of Windsor at the same time. So simultaneously, crew one and crew two are doing the next to impossible feat of nailing perfect focus and perfect sound. The actors are trying to give perfect performances, and they actually acted over the telephone. This is the first one in a while that you grabbed the camera, right? Yeah, uh, I camera operated on the Scott side of the story, on his side of the story. Um, I, yeah, I used to. I mean, just out of necessity, living in Windsor, I didn't know that many other cinematographers, and the ones I did all hated me here, so I couldn't couldn't work with them, even though they were way more talented than me. 
Uh, so like out of necessity, but you know, it's, it, it's interesting because a lot of what happened moving to Toronto and LA, there's a lot of like, well, you should just focus on directing if that's what you want to do. And you go like, yeah, that sounds pretty relaxing. I'll just, you know, I'll just direct. Now at Scarehouse, like, you know, I, I produced and I wrote too, but I, I just directed. And then I sat in the chair, not unlike this, and I watched the monitor, and I'm just like, this is probably kind of boring. Because I'm yeah. used to, like, holding a, a light stand in this hand and a camera in this hand, and maybe the microphone's on my foot because I don't have any gear and can't afford anything. So that's how it was fun to kind of jump back in and, like, and also that way, you know, it's, it's, this, it's this perfect balance of everything has to work. So if I'm part of the one screwing it up, it, it sort of takes the tension, I think, off the rest of the crew. Because, like, oh, the director is going to be the one to, to botch this shot every time. Um, but there's just, for me, there's something about, I guess it would be like, if I was in the army, I think I'd want to be in the trenches. I don't yeah. want to be the general back, you know, making the calls. Like, I mean, sound, it's safer. Safety is boring. Right. When we're talking about not risking my life right. to do anything. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it, it was a lot of fun to kind of jump in and do that. Very sweaty. Yeah. I had that photo where I look like Richard Simmons with all my sweatbands on just so that I don't drip into the camera and ruin a you know, $50,000 piece of gear. My favorite one, because I just happened to be for the take where, where you started at, at Vermouth, walked around the corner, and just as you're walking into Victoria, you get banged right into the side of the door. And that's a wrap. We're reshooting this bad yeah, boy. Thankfully, it was six minutes. And that's the thing, because yeah. every time you mess up, you do have to restart the entire movie and reprop all that the That didn't happen often, though, right? No, we really... So extremely micro budget we yeah. had a number of days to rehearse and we had four days to film so the goal was to or four nights the goal was to shoot it twice per night for four nights so that we would have eight takes to choose from day one we shot a take it was bumpy we, were, we still need more rehearsal let's not do a second take tonight let's figure out all the technical things fix the lighting talk through the performance aspects day two we shot two takes both were like they were okay but there'd be different things where like, oh, well, the camera on this side, that I buzzed the focus three or four times. This side, the camera was perfect. Oh, well, the acting performance was better here than on this side because they were just off that day. And it's very difficult for two actors that aren't on a stage and working right. with each other. It's like if you went to a play and they put a curtain down the middle of the stage and they said, now act together. Right. It's like, you know, there's an emotional element of it. We're being in the room and being in the stage. It's like, it's kind of like the sterile recording of, like Blink-182 did the one album where Tom, they weren't talking, so Tom recorded here, Mark recorded here, and it's the album that most people don't like because right. it's just like, there's no there's no energy, there's no vibe to it. Uh, so then, yeah, day three, we did one take, and everybody went, that's it. This this could be the movie. That was so great. Yeah, there's some flaws in it, but because what we would do is every like lunch break, we would watch the first take, and it was like a sports game take. We'd be like, oh no, okay, tweak the lighting there. Make sure, oh, we forgot to, I forgot to move the camera here and just we'll get it better the next time. And that day we all we all thought what's probably best because we're exhausted at this point is let's go home, get a real night's rest, come back tomorrow and only try to do it one makes more. It makes it easier make it better. though, right? When, once you have yeah. one that you think like, okay, it, worst case, yeah. we've got something we can live with. That second take every night because you go like suck it up, theater actors sometimes do multiple shows a day, but then they don't. You know, there's rarely a technician in a theater show that's got to like, okay, I got to carry this thing on my on my shoulder and nail this perfect focus again. So the next time we came back, we did another one, which was very good. So we ended up with five finished takes of the movie and three misstarts, you know, or ones that we didn't roll. The miss the misstart you talked about was actually on my Instagram. Yeah, uh, I cut it together. Yeah, the, um, we have a thing. It's, it's it's like a it's like a spine. It's called an easy rake, and it, you you strap it on like a body vest. And, and it comes up over top and there's a, a string that holds it. So it takes some of the weights off your shoulders and your back with the camera. And um, I was walking through and there was a GoPro that was rigged there, that Ryan had rigged, that was, you know, lower before with the clearance to get out of the building. And it just snagged on something. I just, fall! <laughs> but we had GoPros rigged on it, you know, to film the behind the scenes. So it was a perfect, like, capture of ultimate failure. So, like, again, showing my failure. That's that's on Instagram for the world to see that I, you know, I'm the one botching this, this super serious single take. 100%. Well, man, the Windsor premiere of this show will be coming up this week because we're going to turn this right around. Yep. The premiere is coming this Friday? No, no, no. No, it will be when this comes out. Oh, sure. Yes. Yeah, see what I'm doing? September, September, September 21st. 21st. So it's not confusing because we talked about today being the 5th. At the, uh, 
at the Chrysler Theater, yep. September 21st, 7 p.m. Tickets are available at the Chrysler Theater box office. Go online, Google it, go on Facebook. There's there's a group for the event. You can find all the information. And uh, I really hope Windsor comes out. I keep saying, I think it's it's a rare opportunity, but if you live in Windsor and like movies, you're going to sit in the audience. You will know somebody's name in the credits. 100%. Because so many Windsor businesses, so many Windsor restaurants, uh, St. Clair College, Victoria Park Place, Vermouth Bar, like all the people that were involved from the university and the college and, you know, every, you know, wouldn't get to make this movie if it wasn't made in winter. So I am, and we're donating a portion of proceeds and uh, some of the sponsorship money to uh, Canadian Mental Health Association. So because the movie deals heavily with suicide, we thought it would be great to partner with them and it's been a wonderful collaboration so far. So just kind of want to enjoy it with the city and hope they'll come out. And, you know, I mean, Italy loves the movie. We've been fortunate and won nine, nine and counting uh, Best Picture Award or Best Feature Awards at festivals. Uh, sold out at the Chinese Theater in Los Angeles, all these things. So I'm, I'm hoping there's some hometown pride that can rally behind, uh, you know, like a, like a, oh, that sport football, they have a homecoming game or something. I don't sport. I sported once, it hurt. Um, you know, I'm hoping this can be our, our homecoming rally and, and get the sport and share it with the audience that to me is the most important, all the people that help make it. I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure that place is going to be packed. And but all of that aside, I know that uh, I'm proud to have you as a friend. Cheers, my friend. It's good to see you, brother. Yep. All right. Uh, we'll catch you next time. You know what to do. Down links below. Click like and subscribe and all of that stuff. See you next time, folks.